Hello and welcome to episode 208 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Vienna, Virginia. This is Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox in Los Angeles. How's it going, Nathan? Good. I want to apologize to the listeners about episode 207 coming out a day late. Oh, yeah. Okay. We've been on a regular schedule lately, but we had a little uh, miscommunication on our back end. And so you got episode 207 a day late. Sorry about that. Cool. Anything new going on? I'm just working my ass off, man. I have a class going in LA, class going in San Francisco. Everybody is hammering the shit out of the ask button in the LSAT demon because I have told them that if they don't hit the ask button, I don't believe them that they're actually studying. Mm -hmm. Show me the money. And yeah, like really you're studying. Okay. Then what are you confused about? Yeah. It can't be the case that you're not confused about something. Right. Like humble yourself, you know, I think students really too quickly get to that. Like, oh, well, I, I mean, I missed it, but I, yeah, I get it. I get this one. Yeah. It's like, why? Because you read the right answer and you convinced yourself that you understand or do you actually understand? Yeah. So, you know, think about it, like try to see if you can ask a good question. The ask button is, is there for a reason. So anyway, now I've got like a, about a two day backlog worth of, uh, all these ask requests. So I'm spending just about every day, uh, chipping away at that. How about you? Yeah. I've been focusing on the, you know, the bug requests or complaints that are coming in and Annalise is doing a great job of helping with that. And I feel like we're making some headway, so that's helpful. And everybody is of course, of course, very patient, which is nice. But it's, um, I don't know, it's onward and upward, right? That's the goal. Yeah, I mean, Annalise is kicking ass. Our whole team is kicking ass. I mean, thanks really to everybody for killing it. It's not it's not me and Ben, really. Mm-hmm. It's uh, everybody else doing all the work. So thanks so much to our team. Speaking of our team, I got an email yesterday from uh, our recently uh, dear departed producer, Sarah. Mm. Yeah, what's up? From law school. Well, she had, it looked like only time to write like a one sentence email, but she just said, she actually had said that, uh, one of the first classes that she, they made her take in her LWR class Mm. is called reading for comprehension. It says it's a, this is the first part of her legal writing homework at actual law school. And it's, it's titled reading for comprehension. And it talks about how you need to start off making sure you understand what you're reading. Because even if you're going slower over time, you'll become faster if you focus on comprehension first. Wow. Okay. That's uh, some solid (laughs) advice from law school. I'm I'm surprised on some level actually to hear that. Well, yeah. I mean, but I'm not though. Because like you do in like legal writing, you you really have to it has to fucking make sense. Mm-hmm. It has to add up, mm-hmm. right? Like the pieces have to be connected. And that's what we keep yelling at people about with logical reasoning and with reading comprehension, both like you, you really do have to get it. It, the words make sense. Yeah. You can totally predict the answers because there's just like, well, there's a reason why this argument doesn't make sense. You can figure out why when you figure out why that's the answer. Mm because things are actually supposed to make sense. This isn't college where you have a thousand page reading assignment and then you have to write a 70 page paper. That's basically nonsense. Yeah. Right. This is, this is like technical writing. Legal writing is technical writing. Mm. These briefs are going to be like short, but they're going to have to actually add up. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, it's interesting that, um, that well, that's her report. She says she misses us, hopes we're doing well. Oh, that's great to hear. Hey, so last uh, couple episodes ago, or maybe last episode, I can't remember, I told you that I had started reading Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Yeah. Well, I ended up finishing it and then started reading it again. I really like what he has to say. I still have some skepticism about some of his claims, whether they're actually true or just psychologically helpful, but regardless, I found it to be a very helpful book and good at, at least for me, I'm sure a lot of people could take away many different messages, but becoming more in tune with what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. And the whole book is about language, which is interesting to me because, uh, 
the LSAT's all about language, but basically he says over and over again, the way you talk about how you feel about things and how you perceive things affects how you feel about things and how you perceive the world. And he just goes through a whole litany of phrases that we use so often that distort reality. And Example? Um, yeah, let me give you an example. Thanks for asking. So one thing that he likes to harp on is people will say, oh, so-and-so made me angry or made me upset or sad or whatever. And he's like, well, hold up. Your feelings in large part, according to him, I don't know if this is true, but according to him, come from the thoughts that you have. And you have a lot of control over what thoughts you decide to dwell on. And so when someone does something, it's not so much, it's, and he gets all into this like causation stuff, but he's like, it's not them making you angry. It's how you decide to interpret and react to their behavior. And it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, but you know, if someone stabs you in the shoulder, like, I feel like they're kind of making me angry, <laughs> you know, it's like, I like to like push back and think about what he's saying, but it's one of those books where it's really challenging the way I see what I say and how I interpret the world. And for that reason, I like it. And so I don't know if he's a hundred percent correct, but I do feel like I'm not necessarily right <laughs> either, or at least the, the way I saw the world before is not necessarily accurate. And so I like that part of the book and that's why I'm reading it again to really kind of get my mind wrapped around what is actually happening and how what we say affects our perception of that reality. At the very least, it's got you questioning your assumptions or yeah. you know, trying to figure out whether he's right or not. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's called nonviolent communication. I think I might write a book about Elsa logical reasoning okay. called violent communication. <laughs> <laughs> how to be pissed off at these fuckers for their stupid arguments and how you can like never miss a question on logical reasoning ever again by just realizing what idiots these people are when they write these bogus flawed arguments. What do you think about that? I think, uh, that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> What's on the show today? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Today we have a voice message from one of our listeners, Jackson, who we did invite to send us a voice message, sent us one. We're going to have a pearls versus turds on, or some tip, I guess, from Nebraska law. Someone wrote in asking, should they do pre-test warmup? Mm. We have some logic games advice. And if we have time, we'll hit a, another logical reasoning from prep test 71. Cool. Alrighty. Upcoming events. Yeah. So you have until Tuesday, September 10th to register for the October LSAT. If you are ready for the September LSAT, then you should be ready for the October LSAT. And it probably makes sense to sign up for that. Even if you're not sure whether or not you're going to take it just so that you have that option. If you decide to take it after you get your September score back or whatnot. Yeah. That advice especially applies to people who want to apply this cycle for 2020 admissions. The clock's really ticking on 2020 admissions. The apps are already open. And so if you're taking September and planning to apply right away, well, if September's not in your favor, you want to definitely be taking October and then applying right away. If you're not applying until, you know, next cycle for 2021 admission, then it doesn't, it's not as important, right? That you take the October LSAT. Yeah. You should be ready for it. If you're ready for September, you should be ready for October. But now that they have a limit again, right? Three times in a cycle. Mm -hmm. And also because you'd have to register for October before you even know how you did in September. If you're applying next cycle, I can see an argument for skipping October. For sure. Yeah. And that $200 incentive, right? To skip it potentially. Yeah. So you could just say, nah, well, I'll wait, get my September score and then maybe register for November. But don't do that if you're trying to go to law school in 2020. 100%. Okay. I agree. Yeah. So just to clarify, there's the September LSAT coming up, then we have October, then we have November, and then we have January and February and March. <laughs> so I think there's been some confusion. People will contact me and they're like, okay, well, I can't make the September. So I'm think I think I'm going to shoot for November. 
And I say, wait, do you know about October? And they're like, no, I didn't know about October. Or they know about October, but they don't know about November. They're just looking right ahead to January. So there's a lot of tests coming up. Yeah. Chances are there will be one that fits your schedule. But you, and you also might want to like look and see right now what testing centers are available. I'm hearing more and more people like trying to register for October, but there's nothing available in their area. Hmm. Maybe because the LSAC doesn't have enough iPads or whatever yeah. tablets. Yeah. Anyway, that's a bummer. They, they, they frequently do at the last minute open up more sites, but right now I, I have heard of people. I, I get like a lot actually of emails of people saying, yeah, I'm trying to register for October, but there was nothing even close to me, like not in my state. <laughs> and so I had to register for November. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. Good to know. You can always email the show at help at thinkinglset.com. Send us your selfies. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, and our lovely website. Thank you, Sarah. The long lost Sarah. Yeah. Thinkinglset.com. Leave us a tu- uh, review on iTunes or anywhere else that you listen to the show. We love it, whether it's good or bad. You can send us a voice message via Anchor. That's an app. Or you can just record it on your phone and email it to help at thinkinglsat.com. Uh, we'll take it in any form that you want to send it to us. We have a podcast slash demon review. Hmm. Okay. What Do you want to read this? Sure. Uh, guys, I just got wind of my 173. I owe you. Thanks for the pod. Why do people do that? Why do people do what? Shorten podcast to pod. Because it's cool. Is it? <laughs> it always kind of irritates me. I don't know why. I'm always just like, it kind of cringe. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I know people. Sounds like a, like a space thing, like a pod. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't know. Thanks for the pod. And thanks for a couple months worth of the demon. You guys were with me all the way from my cold 158. Oh, that's a pretty sweet 15 point improvement. It's been a pleasure to get to know you. You're the best in the game and funny as shit to boot. Sincerely, Boston Rob. That's, that's nice. Yeah, that's great to hear. I I like hearing that we can help on some level. So that's great. I also want to get some negative reviews in here. They're kind <laughs> you of keep fun saying to that. You're a masochist. I, You're I just... know. <laughs> I kind of feel like this is like a puff piece, you know, it's like, yeah, you're so good. I kind of like it when I hear what people are upset about so that I can learn from their perspective. Yeah. If you were me and Mm -hmm. you had a lot of people who hated you, you would not feel that way. Okay. But since you're you, <laughs> you hey, everybody write in mean things about Ben and we'll put those on the show and because then that'll satisfy Ben. I, I get enough of that shit. I don't need any more. All right. Okay, good. Let's get to this voicemail. Yeah. Okay. How do we play this? Are you going to play it? Uh, I played it this morning already. I already listened to it. Hey, it's Jackson Makani Keoi Grub. So what happened was I was just doing the LSAT writing and then my I just worked until the end of the timer and then it ran out and then it said that I hadn't submitted it. Anyway, that's what happened. Don't pay for law school. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, I just re- heard it. Okay. <laughs> we were busting his balls for not hitting submit <laughs> last last show, but uh, or a couple shows ago. But uh, yeah, so he what it was was he just worked all the way till the end of the timer and I forgot. It's weird though. It sounds to me like he was just working and that they were expecting him to submit it before the timer ran. Yeah. Yeah. So that does sound like either there's, there's it could be a user error, Jackson, but it could also could be a software error. We are familiar with those. So it huh. sure seems like if the timer runs out, it should auto submit for you. Yeah. Or <laughs> at mean, least give you the opportunity to do so. Did yeah. He, it should at least a pop up screen. Hey, you're out of time. Would you like to just <laughs> delete the whole thing or, <laughs> or would you like to, you know, submit it? <laughs> they should just give you a thumbs up, thumbs down. You're like, uh, did you like it? <laughs> you want to pay another $15 and try again? Um, I thought it would be fun to see if Ben could pronounce Jackson's oh, name. Oh God. I can't pronounce anything. I know. That's okay. why I thought it would be fun. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> this is the kind of criticism I need. You just heard him say it. I know, but now I, I was like, as he was saying his middle name, I was like, well, that's a, it's a lot for me. Okay. So Jackson, I got that part down. Uh-huh. Oh my God. 
I, 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 McConaughey? McConaughey? So it rhymes with Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey dub. It rhymes with. It's Jackson McConaughey Grub. Oh. You want to give one more shot? Do I want to? No, not really. (laughs) But I I will indulge you. (laughs) Wait, now I can't even say Matthew McConaughey. Okay, so, oh, Jackson McConaughey. Jackson McConaughey. There you go. Pretty close. Yeah, that's pretty grub. So the grub, I got that. Thank you. (laughs) That was interesting. I wasn't sure how that E at the end of your name would be pronounced. Yeah. I I suck so bad. I always pronounce things like shit in class. I can't sound things out. I have to hear people say them like three or four times. And then I just remember how it sounds. Yeah. And that's not just for like names like this. I'm just like talking about words that are not as commonly used. So... I don't know what to say about that. I could take a class, I guess, but I've memorized enough words in my life now that I can get through. <laughs> Ready for this pearls versus turds? I am. Yeah. This is I think serious. it's about personal this statements. A, this guy looks serious. I know. Okay. So we have pearls versus turds, four pearls, 19 turds, 11 ties. We're looking at an image here from what school? Nebraska? Yep. A big N and the image is all red. It's just a red tone image. And it says big in the corner. What's up with that? Because of like, I guess, Big Big Ten. Ten. Yeah, Yeah. because Nebraska, it's like, you know, the only reason why you would go there is because you like football. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, I mean, come on. Then you really got to dig into your reasons for going. Anyways, so the tagline below this, this, well, you got a serious looking dude looking at his laptop. It looks serious to me, actually, or honestly. And then it says study hard. And tell your story. Yeah. Okay. So, hi, so-and-so. Here are a few things to consider. I don't see the subject line, but yeah, like you said, it's presumably about their personal statement. This is long. Huh? This is long. This is long. Okay. Point number one. Now that you've had some time to reflect on the LSAT exam, Mm. (laughs) test exam, Mm -hmm. you reflect on it, (laughs) do you think there is a chance you'll want to take it again? Most people do better on the test the second time they take it. If you have any inkling that you may want to try for a higher score, we encourage you to jump back on the LSAT prep bandwagon. Students in the past have told us that they regretted waiting until their score came out before getting back to studying. Keep going, work hard, and go get it. Okay, actually, uh, that seems like decent advice. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's like the first time I've ever heard a law school admit Admit. that LSAT prep works or that like taking it again helps. (laughs) That all they care about is their high score, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. They normally are just, are like, nah, apply right now because we want your application. But yeah, that's true. So Nebraska's like, look, we need higher LSAT score applicants. So just go get it, especially because they seem to recognize here that taking it multiple times just gives you more shots at the apple. And yeah, uh, right. Yeah. So, okay. Totally. <laughs> One pearl so far. Mm-hmm. Two, have you started working on your personal statement yet? These are kind of weird questions. Mm. Don't know where or how to start? A great beginning might be to tell the story of how you first became interested in law. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. <laughs> well, that, that's weird that they're asking for that. Well, when I was five and I was, you know, how many times have we heard people on the playground concerned about the justice of their fellow I classmates? Know, I know. That's like, a straight up turd right there. Like that's just, that that's, you know, that to me is just like, they just want you to apply. They're just like, you do, Hey, well, do, it doesn't it matter. Almost, Say yeah. anything. Say Truth anything. is we don't give a fuck. We want your LSAT score. Hmm. It's kind and, of interesting. I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. Because they like the, the personal statement quality is not going to affect their their uh, U.S. News and World Report ranking, right? But it is strange too. I almost wonder. Like, this makes me question the caliber of the people who are seeking applicants. Like, w- what are you really looking for? Or maybe maybe I shouldn't be questioning their caliber. Like you said, maybe it just reveals how much they don't care about the quality of their students. Well, do you want to know their LSAT range? I mean. Their 25th percentile is 153. Their 75th percentile is 160. 
They're 75th. Okay, he's 160. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, they really do need, uh, they, they, you know, there's a, the clear path for them improving their law school is to get people with better LSAT scores. So they're, they're worried not, about people who have writer's block. And they're like, look, just write something. Yeah, they're like, we don't care. If you go to 160, you're in. Yeah, that's very. this is very interesting advice, actually, when you contrast it with what they just told you. They're like, get the fucking highest LSAT score you can get. <laughs> yeah, and that then really matters. And then we don't matters. care, just apply. <laughs> Okay, yeah. this this tip continues. Was it when you saw a news story that inspired you to want to work for social justice? My God, Boo. they really don't care. Yeah. Did your business studies... What? Did your business studies start getting you motivated to go down the path of preparing contracts or exploring tax laws? Was there someone you met whose legal work inspired you? Think about what first made you think that law would be a good direction for you and start playing around with telling that story. Playing around? Ugh. I like the fact that they're using natural language. You know, a lot of these law school emails are stuffy, but this is getting a little too informal for my taste. But I just anyways, think it's bad advice. Like, please don't write your turd. personal statement about that. That's dumb. That's that's so easy. That's like anyone can write that story. Like, oh, no, it's because I met a certain person or because I saw a certain story in the news. Yeah, yeah, everybody saw that story in the news and everyone met someone who's similar to the person that you're going to write the story about. And like, it, you're just not, you, it doesn't do anything. It's like, I was, <laughs> like, no shit, you at some point decided you wanted to be a lawyer. Otherwise, you wouldn't be applying to law school. Like, I can assume... I can assume that something happened in your life that made you want to be a lawyer. I don't really care what that is because yeah. everyone has that story. Yeah. Like, I want to know, like, who are you? Who are you? Are you going to deliver? Yeah. Like show me something that you've done. Like show me just, we say this all the time. I don't want to beat it up too much, but like, I want a real recent story from your life where you do something productive. Yeah. Like where you're successful in doing something. I want to see you winning. Yep. hundred percent. Okay. So we have a pearl, a turd, a stinky turd. And then three, have you chosen the law schools to which you will apply? Eh? You might start making a short list. Okay. okay. We recommend selecting a couple of, by the way, is the standard here, but they don't say that a couple quote, solid bet schools. These are, I'm not sure why you need to put that in quotes. These are schools that are high quality, meaning they have a good bar passage and employment rates and good reputations, but will also be schools where you have a good chance of being accepted and that you can afford. <laughs> you mean scholarships? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> that you can afford. Show me the money. Yeah. That's where's the, looking hold for. on. I'm going to look at their scholarship matrix here. Total percent receiving. Wait, hold on. It costs... Uh, what? Weird. Their 509 does not have their tuition on it. Hmm. hmm. It's, it's an undisclosed number. Yeah. Uh, but they had 71% uh, of the class, right? 71% of the school right now is receiving grants. And whoa. <laughs> Holy shit. So, oh my God. Wow. They have a really stark difference between... So 4% of the school getting less than half tuition, 24% of the school getting half to full tuition, 3% of the school getting full tuition, and 40% of the school getting more than full tuition. Oh my gosh. <laughs> At Nebraska. Wow. Now, we don't know how much more than full tuition. That could be just, you know, like it could be literally $1 more than full tuition. We don't, we don't know how that all works out. But, you know, even if we just assume that that's full ride... That's still 43% of the school getting a full ride. Wow. So Wait, hold up, hold up. So that this just betrays exactly their motives, right? Look at tip one, do the best you can on the LSAT. We're going to pay you to come here big time. Yeah. They're totally forking out the dollars to get the, they're gunners. They're going for the ranking. <laughs> Dude, they're in Nebraska. Yeah. This is this is one of those schools. It's Lincoln, Nebraska. Do you want to live in Lincoln, Nebraska? No, you don't. 
And so this is... <laughs> Wait, you got to give our listeners a time to respond to that in their head. <laughs> well, <laughs> they can hit pause if they want to okay. really contemplate it, but you don't. Sure. And mm -hmm. that's what all these schools... I mean, there's a lot of schools in the flyover country that like you, they will pay you to go there because they know nobody wants to go there. So they're, you know, they're going to get their best candidates are going to come from other places on a full ride. That's how they are going to up their scholarship number or they're up their, their LSAT and GPA numbers is by paying you to go there. So, yeah, I mean, this email, you can read right through it. It's like, we're a good safety school. That's basically what they're saying. Mm hmm. Okay, they continue. Then, this is after, you know, you've selected your solid bets. Then you might list one or two, quote, reach schools that are aspirational and are schools you would be surprised and thrilled to learn that you could attend. And if that's Final. us, awesome, because then we'll charge you full price because we have to charge some people full price because we have to give a lot of scholarships. So Yeah, we're paying more than tuition <laughs> to some You're of You're going to be basically paying money. for two students. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, select a safety school or two. Oh. These are schools that would not be your first choice, but if the other options didn't work out, you'd still feel okay, and they don't spell okay, which is strange, about attending. Okay. <laughs> they would not be your first choice, but they should because they're going to give you full rides, maybe. In any case. All right, just understand what you're reading when you read this email. This is a really dumb tip. This is like, this is like, we need content for our newsletter. So let's just start rambling about some shit that everybody knows. Yeah. So, okay. We got Pearl, turd, turd. And then last little paragraph, watch your E dash mail <laughs> inbox from what other inbox would people be looking at, by the way, <laughs> watch your email inbox for more tips. Ooh, more tips from us, more turds from us about applying to law school, preparing for the LSAT, and choosing a law school. Let us know if you have any questions, and above all, comma, enjoy your summer. That's nice. They're being polite. Do you know who you don't want to take tips from about choosing a law school? Law schools. Law schools, yeah. That's a real bad, real bad source of, uh, of tips. Although, yeah, I, don't know. I don't think it would hurt to ask them because I always feel like there's something to glean from people when they start opening their mouths, right? They start talking and you start yeah. to get a better picture. You just can't well, take them literally. <laughs> no, you also could ask them for specific advice. So I'll give you an example. Yesterday I got uh, an email from a dude who is wanting to, or actually no, it was a tutoring student who is applying to... UT. Okay. And which is obviously a really good school. And this dude has been working in commercial real estate or sorry, real estate in a family real estate business. He's a little bit older, right? He's in his early thirties. He's been working mm. in a family real estate business for years now. Mm. Mm -hmm. And his question was about letters of recommendation. Like, okay. do I go back and get professors from 10 years ago to write me a letter? Mm. That mm -hmm. seems kind of weird. Do yeah. I go back and get former employers from six or seven years ago. Cause that also seems kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Well, my other, my other alternatives are my family who I actually work with. Mm -hmm. That seems kind of weird. Hmm. Or like, so what do I do? And he, I immediately thought like, well, it, I would think a client would a client or like a, even a competing or like a colleague broker from another firm. Hmm. Yeah, right. Cause you've be worked with them. Like you've done deals with them. And sure. so they can attest to your, I think like a broker from another firm seems like a really good suggestion, but he, I thought about a client too, because I mean, the client's actually the one who can hire and fire you if yeah. you're in real estate. Yeah. And he had a client who just graduated from UT, mm. which I don't know. That almost like muddies the waters a little bit, but so there I was just like, well, you know, that sure seems like you could call up UT admissions and just ask them, like, what would you prefer to see? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that advice? That's not like he's not doing anything wrong by calling them and asking oh, that question, 100%. right? 100%. See how they respond. Yeah. And, and it, it gives you an They're opportunity. They're not going to remember, too. People are also yeah. worried about You can be anonymous if you want to be, but even if you're not, like, 
They're not going to be like, oh, take note. That guy was trying to figure out what we wanted. Yeah. No, I mean, I would think if anything, it's an opportunity to like develop a relationship with these people. Like if you, if you do that, then they're going to be like, oh, like this dude is a, you know, he's like a, a, a professional person who, you know, he reached out with this very sensible question. Mm-hmm. I don't know. just seems, um, yeah, seems like you, you could definitely call him and ask that question. I, I don't know that you're going to get lots of great tips from a newsletter, but <laughs> you, you definitely could, uh, could use them as a resource if you had like actual questions to ask. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Do you want to read this next one? Sure. Nathan and Ben, do you have recommendations on a pre-test warm-up routine? Perhaps one logic game, one reading comp passage, and a handful of LR questions, for example? My hypothesis is that it would be beneficial to warm up your mental muscles for each section. Also, should the warm-up be previously completed questions, new material, or a combination of both? I've spent more than a decade training youth athletes so I have some teaching and life experience. This podcast is gold, Brittany. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah. Someone just asked me this last night in class. They said that they had been looking back at their five or six tests, and they were starting to wonder whether the first logical reasoning section was harder than the second. And then they correctly said, wait a sec, no. I seem to have trouble getting into the section, getting into the mindset. And one way, that's a problem. And there are multiple ways to solve that. One is to be conscious of it. And when you go into the section, when you first start doing questions, just ask yourself, are you focusing? Are you internalizing what's being said? Are you predicting answers, et cetera? But I don't have a problem at all with people doing a handful of LR questions, two or three, and then just throwing them away. If you happen to be able to take your phone to the test center because you can leave it in your car or whatever, then you can even do them on the demon. I wouldn't stress about it too much. I think Brittany here, you're looking for a very specific like warm up routine, and I don't think it matters. Just do a few questions and then don't worry about it. And I would only do that if you feel like you're consistently struggling to sort of get into the test. I wouldn't just say to everyone, oh, go do a warm up routine. Some people struggle at the end of a five section test. And so doing a warm up routine would just extend this process yeah. out longer. Yeah. So I wouldn't say, everyone do this. I would say, if you find trouble focusing at the beginning of a section, especially where it's easier, and you shouldn't, you should already be focusing, then maybe this makes sense for you. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. My default assumption is that nobody needs to do this unless, you know, if you've learned, like Ben says, if you've learned that you suck on the first section consistently, and if you feel like you just don't get rolling until section two, then fine, like do a little bit of a warm up routine. Don't take it too seriously. Don't like burn your eyes out or whatever. Yeah, 100%. Don't score it. Like, don't worry about really whether you're getting it right or wrong. Just, you know, just like get the ball, whatever it takes to get the ball rolling. But I don't think most people probably don't need to do this. It's a long day, you know, five times 35 minutes. And it's not running. This is not, there's not physical exercise here. You're not going to like hurt yourself or get a cramp if you don't warm up. So, I mean, are you doing this on your practice tests? Like if you're not doing it on the practice tests, then I don't think you should be doing it on the official thing. So, you know, like if if you decide that this is something that you need to do, then I think, okay, fine. You should start doing it consistently. Yeah. But something short, a few questions. Yeah. Like I've heard of people, um, doing a logic game that they have done before. Like even, I I thought it was kind of cool on a piece of, on, on a paper, like a printout of a game and then erase it and then do it again on that same paper. So you've, you can actually like see the ghost of your previous diagram. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I thought that was kind of nifty because it was like training wheels, you know, like w- warming up with it, where you can't fail hmm. or less chance that you could fail. Right. Hmm. Yeah. But l- again, like I said, I default presumption, I, I would never like encourage people to do this unless they like really thought they needed to. Sure. 
And even if you don't need to, but you think you do, I'm okay with it for the placebo effect. <laughs> like that gets yeah, you that's what I'm saying. calm. If you, yeah. If you think you need to, then maybe you need to, but yeah, you don't need to. I don't think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next one. Yep. Okay. So, all right. See, this is the kind of thing I suck at. This is Manuela. Is that right? Sure. Okay. Manuela writes, I would really appreciate advice on approaching logic game questions along the lines of, quote, is completely determined if which one of the following is true. I resort to answering these questions by brute force and testing answer choices one by one. What is your thought process through this question type? Thanks for your time and help. I look forward to hearing back. Kind regards, Manuela. You know, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And it's funny because I got it twice last night. So I feel like this podcast is meant to be or something. Yeah. Anyways, in the two games that we were doing last night, we were actually doing them from test 87. And they have, in both of these last two games, they had if-then statements. And I said, right before doing these questions, I kind of gravitated to the variables that were in the if clause of those if then statements, because if I knew what the if clause variable was going to do, then I would also know what the then clause variable was going to do. So it seemed more likely to re re result in things being determined. Right. And so in both of those cases, it happened to also be the answer, but I would say when I encounter these questions, I look for variables that seem to tap into other rules because they're going to have a bigger impact. Yeah. The other thing I look for sometimes is floaters because if a floater truly seems to be kind of moving around in a lot of my different, you know, mini diagrams or my worlds, then maybe there's no other way to pin it down. So then I might go after a floater, but, um, there was one other thing. I can't remember what it was. While you think of that, let me just, um, make sure that, let me just make sure that students know what we're talking about. The, the oh, question sorry. says, I just yeah, it's in. okay. Yeah. That's okay. The, the question, the, this is a common type of question. It's not like that common. There's maybe one or two per section sure. normally. Yeah. And the question says, you know, the order in which the clowns get out of the clown car is completely determined if which one of the following is true. And so, like, let's say there's seven clowns, different colored clowns getting out of the clown car, right? Mm -hmm. So which one of these answer choices, five answer choices, which one of these new facts will make it so that you know exactly all seven of the clowns, exactly what order they're going to get out of the clown car in? Mm -hmm. That's that type of question. All right. Yeah. So now everybody's yeah. on board. And what you're saying, Ben, is it sounds to me like you're looking for, and it's kind of, it's maybe a little ironic, right? Cause you're looking for kind of two opposite things. Totally you're opposite looking, things. Yeah. <laughs> on the one hand you're looking for like, I, right. So I definitely don't just like look at a, look at B, look at C, mm. like I'm mm -hmm. not testing all the answer choices. Definitely. percent. Yep. Right. I'm, I'm going to like look for a likely suspect and then I'm going to investigate that suspect and see if that's like the one. Mm -hmm. So Ben, the first thing he said was like, well, let's leave the conditional thing aside for a second. Yeah. The, the first thing is like an obvious thing would be, well, who's a player who's connected to lots of other players? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like if G or sorry, the, yeah, the green clown, if the green clown was mentioned in three rules, the, it's very possible that like, if the green clown gets out third, you're going to know everything. Mm -hmm. So I might scan the answer choices looking for green mm -hmm. to just see like, well, does it, do we know, like, does it put, and in fact, if, especially if I had already like made worlds for the game, mm -hmm. I might have like inferred this. I might actually have already, I might already have inferred the answer to this question 100%. by making worlds. one of your worlds might have completed right. Uh, itself I might realize entirely. like, Oh, well when mm -hmm. green's third, I know everything. And yep. then the answer to this question could totally just be green goes third. And you're like, yeah, thank you. Uh, 100%. you know, free point. So that's one. Another one would be, as Ben said, a complete wild card, a floater because the floater has the most flexibility to begin with. If there's an answer that says, well, the floater, you know, the, the red clown goes seventh. Mm -hmm. It might be that once the red clown goes seventh, it's going to lock everybody else into place because the red clown was really the only thing that could move around a whole hell of a lot. Yep. And just to clarify, a floater is a variable that is not constrained by any explicit rules. 
Right. So that could totally be the answer too. Mm -hmm. You want to do the, say the conditional thing one more time? Well, so the conditional is just a, an example of a variable that seems like it affects other variables, right? Or other players. So for example, if you have an if then statement that says, if T is first, then H is second. Is this an answer choice or is this a, an existing rule in the game? An and you're just going to rule. Oh, okay. Game. So you're yeah. looking for an answer that triggers basically an answer that is the sufficient condition on one of the rules. Exactly. Okay. There we go. Yeah. I, I, and then I have a third. So the first one that we talked about here is looking for a player who is connected to a lot of other players or who triggers and affects. And that's the as, same one as looking for the sufficient condition of one of the existing rules in the game. Exactly. The other okay. option is to look for a player who is completely unconnected from anyone, right? Maybe because we know that with, with the other rules, we were unable to pin down this variable in any of our diagrams. So pinning this person down or this player down is necessary if we want to, or likely necessary if we want to completely determine the order or the arrangement of all the variables. The third thing I tend to do if neither of those seem to work or I don't see any answer choices that, you know, lend themselves to those two options, which is rare. But another option is to go through the answer choices and look at variables or look at the answer choice and look at other diagrams that you've created where that answer choice is happening, right? Like if answer choice A says T is in third, and I have a diagram from a previous question where T is in third. And by the way, I'm doing these questions last because I'm doing the if questions before them. If I have a diagram where T is in third and it clearly did not get played out, there were things left moving around, then that answer is wrong, right? So that's one way to also go through these answer choices and save a little time so you don't have to test everything. Yeah, I, I'm definitely doing the answer, t testing them out of order, looking for likely candidates and then seeing if that'll do it. Okay, will that do it? Okay, will that do it? It's like um, you have five suspects in five interview rooms, interview room A, B, C, D, E. Yep. You don't necessarily have to interview them in that order. Nope. <laughs> right? If, uh, if one of them has a whole bunch of priors, <laughs> you might go looking for that guy first. Yeah. And so that's, that's where we would maybe use a little bit of intuition to see if we could find the answer, you know, uh, out of order rather than just like go through them in order. Yeah. Cool. That's a really good question. Thank you. Maybe we should make that into a uh, podcast clip for the course in premium. Ooh, a fundamental. Make it so. All right. Prep test 71. Yeah. Section two. Logical reasoning, question 10. Let's do it. If you want, you can uh, pause the show here. Go uh, get yourself a copy of this question. This question is now, I guess, in the public domain since the LSAC released it on their digital familiarization tool. <laughs> we'll never be able to say that word right. I mean, it's right, but it's just, a, it's just an inherently flawed word. I will just always say it as clunky as possible because it deserves to be said that way. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I'll read this one. Vincent says no scientific discipline can study something that cannot be measured. Comma. Wait, hold up. I'm already like, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can't study something without Measuring if you, if you can't measure it, <laughs> if it's a scientific discipline, I mean, I, I'm, I'm feeling what Vincent is saying. Like Vincent I'm feeling is saying it on one level, but like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of shit you can study without necessarily having a lot of details. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. It, Vince, I mean, I think this is a premise, right? Sure. Vincent says no, no scientific discipline can study something that cannot be measured. That, that to me is like, basically Vincent is proposing a definition of science, well, you know, one aspect of science is that you have to be able to measure shit. Yeah. But we're having that reaction, right? Because if you're not having a reaction to that, I fear strongly <laughs> Yeah, that you're just like, I don't know. How do I describe this? Perusing words. Yep. 
that's how everybody does it. Even people who are, you know, scoring pretty well, like people scoring in the one sixties. I had a couple tutoring sessions yesterday and I could tell that these guys were just like, not just not sinking their teeth into it that, you know, mm-hmm. they would just read that and go right on to the next thing and not really like, they just don't process it. It's just like words, 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 words. Mm-hmm. What, what did Vincent say? I don't know. Something about science measurement. I don't know. And it's like, okay, dude, what you needed to do was there's a comma and right. Mm -hmm. So the first half of that is like its own thought. Yep. And you need to engage with that thought. Like what's Vincent doing here? Is this Vincent's conclusion? Is this Vincent's evidence? Is that like, what do you buy it? And, and even if you don't buy it, like Ben's objecting, Ben's like, wait a second, I can study stuff that I can't measure. Why? Really? Yeah. But you don't have to buy it. If you recognize that it's Vincent's premise, then you go, okay, Vincent, you know, granting your premise, which I might not actually agree with in real life, Mm -hmm. but granting your premise. Now, what else you got? Like, where are you going to go from here? hundred percent. And you got to be able to just like tune into these and, and kind of, boy, it just, it's just a pause. Isn't it, Ben? It's just that like magic five seconds. Yeah. But I don't have time for that. (laughs) You, know? you don't have time not to. We've said it a hundred times. Yep. Okay. So Vincent says that you can't, uh, if you're doing science, you, you have to be able to measure things. Okay. And, and then he goes, and since happiness is an entirely subjective experience, comma, I'll take another pause there. Mm-hmm. Like, do I agree that happiness is entirely subjective? Are you telling me that I can't measure happiness in any objective way? Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Uh, You know, maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. I don't know. Yep. Sounds like Vincent is giving premises, right? The word since is indicating a premise. Yeah. And partly because we have and, which is also a premise indicator when it comes between two claims Mm -hmm. and since I'm going to do less like evaluation of whether mm-hmm. or not I agree with that. I'm, I'm more apt than I was with the first claim to just accept it, mm-hmm. but I'm still making sure that I understand it. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. Vincent says happiness is entirely subjective comma. It cannot be measured. Ugh, bad. Well, there's an assumption in Vincent's argument. Yeah, there is. That's why Vincent, it's, it's bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. V- Vincent has assumed that you can't measure things that are entirely subjective. Yep. I don't okay. know that. <laughs> no, I, I don't know that. I don't know shit about any of this. Yeah. But so here's what we got. Vincent has two premises, an assumption, a, a kind of a sub conclusion <laughs> and an unstated conclusion, right? If you add all this up, if you give Vincent his two premises and his assumption, then you would conclude that, uh, science can't study happiness. Sure. So, I mean, that's what he's saying. The explicit conclusion is that happiness cannot be measured, but then the implication when you combine all this together is yeah, study, you can't study happiness. Yeah. If I got, if he reordered Mm -hmm. the whole thing, he would go, happiness is entirely subjective, so it can't be measured which mm-hmm. contains the assumption that subjective things can't be measured. Mm-hmm. And then if he said no scientific discipline can study something that can't be measured, then there would clearly be an unstated conclusion here, which is science can't study happiness. Sure. Okay. All right. Now all that goes through our head in 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. Yolanda, what do you got Yolanda? Yolanda says just as optometry relies on patients reports of what they see, Happiness research relies on subjects' reports of how they feel. I guess, yeah, I, I, I already knew, I, I like predicted what Yolanda was going to say next. I'm like, Yolanda, are you saying that optometry is a science? Mm-hmm. And that's her final sentence. She says, surely optometry is a scientific discipline. Okay, so Yolanda has said, hey, look, optometry is a scientific discipline. That's a, a premise of her option, of her argument. Mm -hmm. Another premise of her argument is optometry relies on patients reports of what they see. Mm -hmm. And she compares that to happiness research, which relies on subjects reports of how they feel. I guess she's talking about subjectivity, huh? Because she's talking about subjective subjects reports. 
Yeah. And how they feel, which sounds subjective. So the question turns out to be a disagree question. Vincent's and Yolanda's statements provide the most support for concluding that they disagree over which one of the following. Do we think they're arguing about evidence or do we think they're arguing about conclusion or do we think they're arguing about both? I think that they're arguing about both, but the conclusion part sticks out to me more right now just because Yolanda said, surely optometry is a scientific discipline. And that suggests that she thinks that happiness is as well. And as we just read Vincent's argument, no scientific discipline can study something that cannot be measured and happiness apparently cannot be measured. Therefore, according to Vincent, although he's making an assumption, he doesn't think it's a scientific discipline. So, or at least studying happiness is. So I would say... She thinks happiness research is a scientific discipline. He's saying it's not. But I'm open to other disagreements or point of issues. And I would right, probably just right. go into the answers and look and be like, oh, wait a sec. Hmm, what does Vincent think? What does Yolanda think? It's interesting, though, because if you cover up the answer choices, I was just going to ask you, you know, does Yolanda disagree that happiness is an entirely subjective experience? She doesn't talk about that. Yeah. Right. So, no. Yeah. We don't know, really. That's the problem. We don't know. Does Vincent disagree that optometry is a scientific discipline? Doesn't talk about it, so we have no clue. Right. Yeah, it's it's just like you can basically predict what the wrong answers are going to be. Right? Because it's just like things that Vincent said but Yolanda didn't talk about, things that Yolanda said but Vincent didn't talk about, those are not going to be the answer because we need something that like on the page we know for sure they're disagreeing about. Yeah. Okay. Answer choice time. Let's do it. A says happiness is an entirely subjective experience. Okay. Yolanda doesn't talk about that. So that's out. (laughs) B says optometry is a scientific discipline. (laughs) Vincent doesn't talk about optometry. So that's out. I I, I did not read those answer choices before. I I, like, I, I just like, I knew that those were going to be wrong answer choices. C, a scientific discipline can rely on subjective reports. Okay, so this, this is interesting. I This is not something that I predicted or thought about, but I would go back and think about each person individually. So what is you, since huh, subjective reports, what does Yolanda say? Well, she says that both of these disciplines optometry and happiness research rely on subjective reports. She also says optometry is a scientific discipline. So clear. Yes. From yeah, Yolanda. She would Let's agree see. on that. Yep. Wait a sec. So Vincent says happiness is entirely subjective. It can't be measured. So to say that a scientific discipline can rely on subjective reports, he doesn't talk about reports, but it kind of alludes to that idea. So I would keep this open. I wouldn't yeah. pick it. I don't think you would even go through that analysis. Honestly, I think you would, you would go, well, maybe let me get, let me see what D and E have to say. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't I, think you would take a lot of time. I think you would go, mm, maybe because if you can get rid of D and E, then the answer is going to, you know, then you would go through the like analysis. I think mm-hmm. anyway, D says happiness research is as much a scientific discipline as optometry is. Okay. Vincent doesn't talk about it it's out. Vincent doesn't talk about optometry at all. And Yolanda doesn't take the position that happiness research is as much a scientific discipline as optometry is. She just says optometry is science, is science and happiness research is similar, Mm -hmm. but she's not saying it's like, she's definitely not like saying that the two are equal. I mean, what E experiences that cannot be measured are entirely subjective (laughs) experiences. (sighs) Okay, so this is a false contrapositive of what Vincent was saying. Right. right. I, mean, I don't mean to use LSAT jargon, but Vincent basically assumed that if something is entirely subjective, it can't be measured. That's not saying if something is cannot be measured that it's entirely subjective. That's confusing your if and then statement or your necessary and sufficient conditions. Right. And Yolanda didn't even talk about things that can't be measured. That's right. So that's a terrible answer. Terrible. So A and B were predictable wrong answers. D and E are just like not what these people are talking about. Go back to C. A scientific discipline can rely on subjective reports. 
Vincent said no to that. Yolanda said yes to that. Yeah. And so one thing the answer. I, I, I felt like when I did my analysis, there was a little question mark in my head about Vincent. And I think that the test writers may even have thought that on some degree because they said provide the most support for concluding that they disagree. Hands down. Like th- there is the most evidence here for C that they disagree about it, even if it's not a must be true in my mind. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you change subjective reports to subjectivity or yeah. something, then you're happier yeah. with that. Vincent took a position. Yeah, on that. exactly. Yeah. But it's so small. I don't Whatever. Yeah. Especially it's, compared to these other answers they are horrible. Yeah. That's what and like, it's all that when, ever matters. Right. And so you'll get students who are like quibbling with C well, wait a second. Reports was never mentioned. It doesn't talk about subjective reports. And it's like, (laughs) yeah, I know. But (laughs) what else are you going to pick though? Yeah. Because we like, that's what it always comes down to, right? Well, what'd you pick then? And and tell me why you think that's better. Cause that's all that matters. Yeah. And when, when those four wrong answers are conclusively wrong, then yeah, like, okay, you're going to have to sometimes let go or, or, look, words can have multiple different meanings, right? Or shades of meaning or whatever. And one of these answers is meant to be right. Mm -hmm. And you, you've identified the four wrong ones and you've got a tiny little baby quibble with the other one. Well, okay, fine. Let go of it. (laughs) That's the answer. Move on. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's see. We just hit the one hour mark. You want to do one more question? I say we wrap it up actually, if that's okay. Yeah. We're giving them what they pay for already, I guess. (laughs) So you can um, join the Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. There's over 1,500 members there. A lot of chitter chatter there. <laughs> you can follow us at on Instagram at Thinking LSAT or on Twitter at Thinking LSAT. Um, Nathan, you can follow him at NFox and me at Olson Benderman on Twitter. My website is strategyprep.com if you want to take a live class in D.C. Nathan's LSAT or <laughs> website is foxlsat.com. He has classes in both San Francisco and L.A., as well as tutoring options and other online tools. Our joint project is lsatdemon.com. We love it. We continue to work on it every day, as you probably heard earlier on the show. Check it out. You can do a free trial for a week and then sign up for a subscription and start doing practice problems from your phone anywhere at any time. Thank you very much. That was episode, I don't know what episode that was, 208. Thanks all y'all for listening. Don't pay for law school. What happened to nice knowing you? I don't, I can't remember what we said. (laughs) Where'd it go? (laughs) Like, I just read it every time. I can't even remember. We lost it. Oh, I got deleted off of here somehow. Yeah. I'll have to put it back on. Yeah, well, nice knowing you, by the way. Yeah, nice knowing you. (laughs) 